very interesting topic that I learn something from every time. So, okay. Dr. Harkness. Well, yes, <laughs> uh, Dr. Harkness, I'm very glad that pictures are not projected because my head would not fit on the screen <laughs> after your introduction. <laughs> So, I would like to start out with a couple of questions. And uh, one question is, uh, what do you think? What percent of children with asthma have allergies? Anyone would like to throw out a number? 80? Kathy, you're right. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, <laughs> 80 to 90 percent of children with asthma actually have allergies. The percentage is lower in adults, so it's probably estimated around 50 percent. The second question is, what percent of the time does the patient's history and physical exam alone yield to correct diagnosis of allergy? Is it in 80 percent of the time? 50% of the time, or 25%. Anyone Hello? would like to guess? Oh, I'm sorry. Hello? Oh, that's okay. Who, uh, who just joined us? Hello? Okay. So the question was... So the question is, if you do, don't do any testing, mm -hmm. just base your diagnosis on the patient's history and your physical exam, what percent of the time would you be correct in making a diagnosis of allergy? 50? Kathy, you correct again. <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you win the prize. <laughs> yes. So actually, I have experienced this in my own practice when patients were referred to me with diagnosis of allergy and they had all negative skin tests or uh, the allergy was not suspected, and surprise, we have fine allergies. So it's only about half of the time you're going to be correct. Um, <clears throat> so what is atopy? The atopic individuals produce specific IgE antibodies in response to exposure to allergens. Uh, the IgE antibodies were discovered by uh, Ishizakas in the 1960s. And since then, we have learned a lot about their role in uh, respiratory diseases and other diseases as well. And there are numerous studies that demonstrate that increased serum IgE levels are associated with higher asthma prevalence, persistent wheezing in children, and airway hyperresponsiveness, which is one of the hallmarks of asthma. Uh, this is a slide from Dr. Burroughs, and it's old and since 1989, but it just shows that uh, we have known this for many, many years. And as you can see, that on a uh, you have the serum IgE uh, levels from 0 0.32 to all the way to 3200. And uh, on a uh, vertical is the odds ratio for presence of asthma. And as you see, there is a direct relationship of uh, increased IgE levels in the serum and increased prevalence uh, or odds of having asthma. Uh, moreover, you're probably all familiar with the Asthma Predictive Index. Uh, this index was actually initially developed in Tucson, Arizona, but has been adapted by the uh, NHLBR guidelines. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, an index that helps us to decide which wheezing infants and young children actually will end up having asthma, and which ones should we start on a, a controller anti-inflammatory therapy. And as you can see in red there, that allergic sensitization to aeroallergens is one of the major criteria that will predict the increase on odds uh, for having asthma in later life during school age. And uh, one of the minor criteria is 
being allergic to milk, egg, or peanut. And very recently, a study came out showing that if you have these two things, being allergic to inhalant allergens and food allergens in infant, then the odds for having asthma are even further increased. Mm -hmm. So the two together, foods and inhalants. <clears throat> this is a cartoon showing actually the allergic reaction, what's happening in the body. And as you can see on the left side, there is the allergen, it's a pollen that enters the body, usually through mucus, mucus membranes. And upon the first exposure to the allergen, the body responds by production of IgE antibodies. And these are those Ys, Y kind of shaped, uh, uh, well, whatever, uh, you know, <laughs> Y shaped uh, things. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, can't find the word. Okay. And they circulate, and then they attach they attach to cells. For instance, on the right side, you have a mast cell as an example of one of the inflammatory cells. And this is a sensitized individual, no symptoms yet. And a second exposure to the same allergen, this allergen will abridge two IgE molecules that are attached to the cell, and this results in a release of various mediators of inflammation. And this is an allergic reaction. Now, on this slide, on the left side, it shows a number of inflammatory cells. And these are not all of them, but these are the major ones, mast cells, macrophages, eosinophils, lymphocytes, epithelial cells, platelets, neutrophils, myofibroblasts, basophils. On the middle are the inflammatory mediators that are released from these cells. Again, this is not a complete list. These are just the major ones. As you can see, histamine, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and so forth. And what these mediators do is, on the right side, cause bronchoconstriction, leakage from microvascular uh, structures, which leads to edema of the airway, mucus hypersecretion, airway hyperresponsiveness, and in some cases, actually, airway structural changes, which we call airway remodeling. So as you can see, all these things in the red on the right side, we see in asthma, in the airway, as well as, you know, in the upper airway. So to uh, confirm Kathy's answer to the first question, <laughs> History and physical exam <laughs> alone yield to correct diagnosis of allergy only in 50% of the time. And the other important thing is that allergen and irritant exposure control is one of six priority messages identified by the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program Guidelines in Implementation Panel. So it's been emphasized that in management of asthma, this is a very important uh, aspect, important step. So that leads me to a conclusion that actually allergy testing uh, is important and the guidelines recommend that all uh, patients with persistent asthma should uh, have allergy testing. And we have two options for testing for allergies. One is a skin test. And what we use today is called a skin prick test or epicutaneous test. In the old days, we used intradermal testing, which is similar to tuberculin testing, which actually the allergen was injected into the skin, making a little blood. First of all, it was very painful. I hated to do it in children. And secondly, subsequently, it has been shown that it is not reliable because you can get a release of mediators just from the trauma mm -hmm. rather than, uh, uh, so it's not a specific. So you can have positive tests in absence of real allergies. So this is not recommended. Moreover, every, uh, I mean, intradermal testing for foods is contraindicated because of the high risk of anaphylaxis. So 
Generally, allergy testing, skin testing involves an allergist consult and done by a trained allergist. There is a small risk of anaphylaxis with the epicutaneous test as well, but it's very minimal. Contraindications. Patients have to be off antihistamines prior to skin testing, and now using the new generation antihistamines, it has to be five to seven days. So for some patients who have a severe allergic rhinitis, conjunctivitis, it's just practically impossible <laughs> to stop the medication. And also sometimes patients with certain uh, dermatological diseases, particularly severe atopic dermatitis, where you just don't have an intact skin where, where you can test. So uh, the option then is an in vitro testing. Uh, this requires phlebotomy, and again, this can be challenging in a chubby two-year-old to find a vein because they need to get about, I think, five uh, ml of blood. It's generally more expensive than skin testing, but the advantage is that it can be used in patients who are taking antihistamines and, of course, no restrictions for dermatologic uh, problems and no risk of anaphylaxis. It can be ordered by nearly all medical personnel. The trick, though, is that it has to be a reliable laboratory. And this is a test that you're probably familiar with as a RAST test, but it's not done anymore. A RAST means radioallergo uh, immune test. Today, it's an immunocap. It's a different test. Um, type of uh, uh, procedure that's being done, and it's more uh, accurate, and uh, uh, there are some really good reference laboratories who do a reliable test. And there are about 500 different food and inherent allergens that can be tested. And all in the same test? I mean, in the same blood, yeah. One same sample blood. Blood. One sample yeah. can test for 500. One, well, we don't usually test for 500, <laughs> 500 and, and actually it's something I don't recommend to do. I call it a fishing expedition. You know, you really need to have a specific reason to test with a particular allergen. So you have to have a suspect. So you have to have a history that suggests that this allergen may be involved in the patient's history. Because I get to it later, but... <clears throat> I think it's going to be, yeah, I'm going to talk about it here. The interpretation. It's very, very important to correctly interpret these tests, whether it's a skin test or whether it's an in vitro test, in view of the patient's history. Uh, if we it said that if you just take people out of the street who have absolutely no symptoms, uh, one in four will have some positive skin test. See, it's different to be, you can be sensitized, but the level of sensitization is below your threshold for symptoms. Mm -hmm. So you have positive skin tests or in vitro tests, but you don't have symptoms. So that's totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. One of the mistakes I have seen is particularly with foods, that these panels of foods are being ordered Patients are, kids are taken off foods into very restricted diets, whereas some of those have no clinical significance. Now, um, what I find very helpful is, of course, the following the skin test, the interaction with the parent, and reinforcing avoidance measures. Because if you have a positive in vitro test, it's just a number. It doesn't mean much. But if I do a skin test on the back and I get a 10 millimeter wheel and a 25 millimeter erythema to a cat, and I tell the parent, look, this happens in your child's lungs when he or she inhales this allergen, that makes much more sense and it makes them more motivated to, uh, you know, to do something about it. So that's, that's I think, the other, other advantage of the test. So, again, as I said, we have to uh, uh, 
correlate the significance of the test with the patient's history. Keep in mind that the allergic response has two phases, immediate and delayed response, allergic or asthmatic response. And this is illustrated by a uh, person who mows the grass in the afternoon, starts wheezing, takes his albuterol inhaler, <clears throat> and is fine, and wakes up in the middle of the night with severe asthma, needs to go to the emergency room <laughs> to be treated. That's a late response. So uh, <clears throat> when we're taking the history, I think we need to keep in mind these two uh, phases of the allergic response. And again, you know, we reinforce how the exposure to these allergens or, some, well, irritants can worsen asthma. Now, I'd like to emphasize here, I'm not talking about irritants here. They are not allergens. Cigarette smoke, we don't test for it. It's an irritant that will make asthma worse. We are talking about specific allergens that result in production of IgE antibodies and the allergic response. It's not to say the irritants are not important. They are extremely important. <laughs> Can I ask you a question, yes. a quick question? So if you only identify allergens 50% of the time, but that you need to have a suspect before you do a test, how uh, if 50% of them you don't catch by history and physical, then you wouldn't normally test them. Right, right. right. So, so you're, you're still them. missing them. Right. Okay. You're correct. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So now I would like to uh, proceed to the treatment options for allergies. There are basically three treatment options. Allergen exposure reduction, medications to control the inflammation and symptoms, and treatment that we call immunomodulation treatments, where we actually change the immune response, and this is the allergy shots, allergen immune therapy, and the anti-IgE therapy, or omalizumab. I'm not going to talk about medications here, because uh, I think, I feel like, because of the time uh, restraints, I would like to address the other two in more detail. I'd like to mention only one medication which actually uh, prevents the allergic reaction, prevents that cascade that I have shown, the release of mediators, and that's chromalin. Unfortunately, mm. it's not available anymore other than in nebulizer form because of the EPA uh, requirements of changing uh, CFC propellants to HFA, and this company in England, the Fison's, uh, just did not have the financial means to do that, and the drug wasn't really used that much to, to justify it, so they did not submit to that. But I would like to emphasize that if the chromoline is given to a patient before allergen exposure, it will prevent all those events that I was showing and actually because it stabilizes mast cells and prevents the mediator release. And uh, uh, it's a more, uh, you know, treatment that addresses the, the core of the disease, whereas with all the other medications and inhaled steroids, you're just trying to repair the damage, what the allergic reaction has caused. But I, would, um, I have recommended it to many patients, like for instance, having a child and going to visit grandma with five cats, to purchase the nebulizer, get the, uh, the nebulized chromoline, and give it four times a day during the visit. Hmm. And uh, because that can save an emergency room visit. Dr. Mercy, how far in advance does that need to be given before the exposure? Uh, just immediately just before. Immediately. Oh. Yes. Now, I had this experience, uh, we learned this at asthma camp. We used to have great asthma camps. And uh, um, the kids who were allergic to horses couldn't go on a horseback ride. And it was, you know, breaking hearts. Mm -hmm. So what we did is, and at that time it was Tylid, which is mm -hmm. similar to, to Permalin, uh, we would give them an antihistamine and Tylid six puffs about 30 minutes before they went on horses. Everybody did fine. Mm -hmm. 
So I think it's a very uh, useful drug. Okay, so let's talk about the allergen exposure reduction. Okay, <clears throat> indoor allergen exposure. Well, the, one of the most effective, cost-effective <laughs> and effective treatments is removing the pet from the home if the child is allergic to the pet. Now, this is easier said than done because as you probably have the experience, they will tell you, well, ah, uh, you know, we had uh, Mimi since we had our child, and that's a, <laughs> it's a member of our family, and we're just not going to do that. You really have, it helps when you show them the skin test size. And also, you know, there are some alternatives. And so when you see that there's absolutely no way they will park with their kid, then there are just minimal things that needs to be done. Remove carpeting, because you can never remove the allergen completely from the wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Remove carpeting uh, from the home, basically. Uh, wash the cat, <laughs> bathe the cat, and definitely exclude the cat from the bedroom and use some uh, HEPA filtration systems. But it does not reduce the allergen. I like to say this example that uh, years ago they did done a study uh, when they washed the cat to remove all the allergen and they separated the allergen from the, the water, the solids from the water and the allergen from the solids and measured the amount of cat allergen in what came off the cat. And they got some 320 international units of cat allergen. Then they took an afghan that the cat was sleeping on and did the same procedure with that afghan. And they got 10,000 units of cat allergen. So it just tells you it's not exactly, you know, that cat, but what the cat leaves behind. Okay. Now, remove carpeting from the bedroom. Wash bedding on hot water setting once a week. Do not dry the linen outside because you take all the pollen right into bed. And it has, does it have to be over 130? Is that the... Yeah, right. Hot water for mites. Matter? For mites. For mites, but for mites. not for, it doesn't yeah. matter for other right. things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in, uh, you know, in case the mattress and the pillows in, in the allergen-proven casing, mold control measures, again, mite and mold control measures in New Mexico are not as essential mm -hmm. than they are in Louisiana, for instance. Uh, because mites don't do well at uh, our dry climate. They require 50% indoor humidity. And uh, <clears throat> a study in Los Alamos actually was done, and they looked at mite allergen in the homes of asthmatic children, and they didn't find any. Mm -hmm. We are a little lower than Los Alamos, and there may be some old adobe humid homes where there might be some mites. Or if people move here and bring their mattresses from humid climates, again, those mites, that mite allergen will still be there. Mold control, same thing goes for mold control. Unless it's a home that's humid, unless there's an overuse of humidifiers, unless there are leaks in the plumbing or room, you know, a roof, uh, we won't have in the average home that much mold. So, but the best mold control is use, of course, dry things out and use uh, chlorine, Clorox type of uh, cleaners. And the HEPA filtration in the bedroom, or it's, uh, uh, it's good, but I, uh, electronic um, um, filters are not recommended because they produce uh, ozone and that can be toxic to, to the lungs. So, outdoors. Well, it's just common sense, okay? When it's very windy, high pollen count, stay indoors. But you can't lock the kids in. <laughs> uh, keep bedroom windows closed at night. When you're driving in a car, have the windows up. Uh, and of course, you know, avoid doing yard work. And this is something that when I recommend this to the parents where the teenager is sitting there, I get this big grin. <laughs> I'm really happy with that. Okay. Allergy shots, allergen immunotherapy. 
is a repetitive administration of specific allergens for the purpose of developing immune tolerance. It's not desensitization, it's developing of immune tolerance. And uh, uh, it's indicated for management of disorders that are mediated through IgE. It's allergic rhinitis, conjunctivitis, allergen-induced asthma, and hypersensitivity to stinging insects, hymenoptera, like bee and wasp and that. It's not indicated for food allergies, for urticaria and geodema, and it's somewhat controversial in atopic dermatitis. There are some new studies that show it might be effective, but uh, that's still not settled. Uh, so the objectives are to reduce responses to allergy triggers that precipitate symptoms, and that thus decrease the inflammatory response and induce immune tolerance. And again, what I tell parents when I explain to them this, that um, we are giving the immune system tiny, starting with very tiny amounts and showing, look, this doesn't hurt. Look, you can take this, you can take it, and increasing the dose gradually until the immune system says, okay, <laughs> I can take it. Uh, At the cellular level, what is, what's going, I mean, the, the antigen still matches up with the Y, right? Oh, it's not effective. It's not Does effective. Right. Well, actually, yes, it reduces. Um, I didn't include, you know, the, all the things that happen on a cellular level. They are very detailed. Mm -hmm. But one of the things is that uh, it prevents the seasonal rise in IgE antibodies. For instance, people are allergic to, for instance, uh, juniper, you know, and or um, mulberry, seasonally the IgE will rise and this treatment will prevent it. Okay. okay. And, and it has many other, other uh, physiological you know, effects that the bottom line is that induce this immune tolerance. Okay. Now this is the only approach that actually alters the course of the asthma disease because the other medications will just work while they are given. And what is very exciting is that in allergic rhinitis patients, this treatment may prevent development of asthma. This is a very intriguing concept, and it was first brought up in 1968, year I came to this country, by Dr. Johnston, who published a study in children showing that children who had no asthma but had allergic rhinitis and they were given allergy shots as opposed to children uh, control group, they were not given allergy shots, they had a significant reduction of uh, development of asthma. That study, has, of course, over the years, absolutely has not satisfied the criteria for <laughs> that are needed today for a valid, valid study. Okay, so, uh, but I will show you next slide about that. Uh, the risk of our treatment is that it can result in local and systemic reactions, including anaphylaxis. And that's why it's recommended that the shots have to be given a physician's office that's equipped to treat anaphylaxis, and the patients are asked to stay for 30 minutes for observation after the shot, just in case. And it's not recommended if the patient's asthma is poorly controlled for the same reason, because of the anaphylaxis could be severe, including the asthma. So this is the one study that was done recently, uh, actually 2001. And they looked at children 7 to 13 years of age who had allergic rhinitis and no asthma. Three, they were three years on immunotherapy, and they had two years follow-up after they shot, stopped the shot, shots. In the control group that did not really receive the shots, 58% developed asthma. In the immunotherapy group, 23% developed asthma. So this is kind of, you know, a very intriguing observation that I'm sure will be addressed more in the future. Sublingual immunotherapy, it's called SLIT. This is a, a new wave and a general, very, very much used in Europe. 
not that much in this country yet, where actually the allergen is given under the tongue and its treatment can be given at home and systemic reactions are fewer with the uh, subcutaneous treatments but can occur and uh, um, certainly you know this is a so much easier thing to do because with the allergy shots what I found in my practice the most most difficult thing was the compliance mm -hmm. once or twice a week once a week injections regularly it's kind of sometimes difficult to fit into busy family schedules so this this kind of a treatment is a novelty and uh, uh, not that much used in this country yet but again in the future anti-IgE therapy you probably all heard about uh, Zolaire or omalizumab which is a anti-IgE antibody and uh, is uh, indicated for patients with moderate to severe asthma over 12 years of age that are not controlled uh, adequately on medications. And if it's given as an add-on therapy to inhaled corticosteroids, it will significantly reduce exa asthma exacerbations and in many cases allows decrease in doses of inhaled corticosteroids. And the way it works is, and if I can go back to my about third slide, how do I do that? Just by one by one or? Because I would like to show you, oh yeah, good. That one, yeah, okay. What happens is that there is your IgE, you know, the Y is floating, and uh, this anti-IgE will bind to this IgE and prevents it from attaching to mast cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's the principal, you know, principal way it works. And uh, uh, probably can go back. How did you do that? Just, uh, uh, do you want to go back to where you were? Yeah, I'm going to go back to where. It binds the receptor. Me. Um, Not the receptor, it binds the, the antibody. It's an anti-antibody antibody, you know. Okay. So it binds it and prevents it from attaching to the effector cells. Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I go next. All right, and then just show you a very recent fresh of the press study mm -hmm. from Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and this is, I believe, comes from Canada, where they reviewed insurance claims of over 3,000 patients who were receiving the uh, Zolaire, and they find 51% reduction in emergency department visits and 28% reduction of asthma-related hospitalizations in patients who have been consistently receiving uh, the omalizumab injections. Now, the problem with that is two problems. One is the cost. It's very expensive. And the other problem is that it may actually cause anaphylaxis, which was not initially uh, expected. And so when I stopped practicing at that time, the patients were required to stay for two hours after a shot for observation. And again, you know, <laughs> it can be very difficult. Okay. so. Uh, with this, I will uh, stop my profuse <laughs> use of words and ask you some questions. Uh, what would anybody like to say what was the most useful in this presentation that you can use in your practice? Wow. I like that that eighty percent of children compared to adults, so it's more in children. Yes. so. And that's kind of, you know, I think it, it's kind of sad that the omalizumab is not approved in children because I think that's where it would be most effective. Anybody else? No? Um, I would like to say that uh, I was surprised to hear that the allergy shots, the, the immunotherapy were so beneficial in preventing asthma. Oh. Yes, 
that, that certainly is the information that is being kind of revived recent, in recent years, brought up many years ago, and now it's being looked at. And it but makes we sense. don't do that until the age of seven? Uh, well, you can actually start uh, around age five. Okay. This was just a study where they chose age seven, but five is probably. Is that the youngest age you saw in your practice typically for immunotherapy? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was at one point it was recommended starting at five. Some allergies start at three. Mm. What about um, allergy testing? Because I've heard different kind of rumors through the years that skin testing has, there's a, a lower age limit at a point where below that maybe the immune system isn't developed enough or is there any truth to that sometimes people will tell me they can't, they were told they can't get their kids allergy tested until they're five or two and okay it's it is it is a myth really <laughs> uh i think you can test quite well six months and up mm -hmm. sometimes in these infants the <clears throat> skin test response may be a little lower, mm -hmm. you get smaller wheels, but we always put on a histamine control. Mm -hmm. And if the skin reacts to histamine, that means that the test will be valid. And we compare the mm -hmm. result of the skin test to the histamine because what happens at the site of the skin test, actually histamine is released and causes the wheel and erythema. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's a good way to interpret the skin test, comparing it to the histamine control. And if you get a positive histamine control, you're going to get a valid test. And of course, you can do the immunocap, mm -hmm. you know, in, in any, age. any age. Yes. And actually, you know, the cord blood IgEs are sometimes being also correlated with later development of allergies, mm -hmm. so they may be present. And there is also some concept that maybe there is an in vitro, I'm sorry, in utero <laughs> sensitization oh, wow. may happen in some Okay, so um, so does anybody disagree with that statement that we made here that you can make a diagnosis of allergy only half of the time without doing testing? No? If nobody Sad. disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, does anybody do allergy testing in the office? Either skin test or in vitro? I have ordered the in vitro tests because yes. uh, I work in a very rural clinic and sending somebody to an allergy specialist to do the skin test is very difficult. Right, I understand. How do you interpret those tests though? That is hard. Um, <laughs> if I get some that have higher elevations of, of response, then I will refer them to an allergy specialist and I'll explain to the parent that I can't really interpret them. It's not like a certain number gives us a certain symptom or something like that, but I'll say it looks like they are allergic to some things and they need further follow-up. Right, I think that's the correct approach. Um, actually, you know, when I was looking at the tests, uh, they are usually referred the international units but also class, and class zero through six. And actually class one, two, usually have no clinical significance. Class three, maybe. Four, five, and six are the ones now that, that you might want to look at closer and correlate with the history. Now with the okay. foods, yes? Yes? Oh, I was just saying that's good to know. Yeah. With the foods, actually, there are specific guidelines, and I don't have them here now, where uh, with different food, there is a different criterion for the IgE level hmm. and different ages as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So for egg and peanut and wheat and milk, you know, you will have certain levels that have been shown to correlate with symptoms whereas others don't. And what's considered to be a gold standard of uh, proving food allergies is a double-blind uh, 
challenge, mm -hmm. which is very <laughs> difficult to perform again, and uh, uh, it's done in academic centers. But when it comes to where you have multiple positive tests and multiple allergies, food allergies suspect, I think it's best to refer to these centers where they can do that. Mm -hmm. I tend to, uh, we have one adult allergist at the university, so I will send my more complicated folks mm -hmm. to him for sure. Uh, you know, the person that I get back a 4200 IgE right. level, um, or et cetera. Um, but I tend to um, do some of the in vitro testing, you know, mm -hmm. again with the history of, oh, well, they think that this happens around this time of the year. If they don't yeah. want to wait the months and months it takes to get right. to the allergist, then sometimes I'll start. Mm -hmm. There. Yeah. And I know what he likes to order anyway, so <laughs> I get him a yes. head start. <laughs> um, just kind of a, a little uh, pearl for practice. We are in the middle of uh, juniper season here in Albuquerque, but juniper tends to cause a lot of nasal and eye symptoms and not that much asthma exacerbations. Mm -hmm. The pollen that's associated with asthma exacerbation is the mulberry. Uh -huh. And that comes in Sorry. April. So just keep watching for that. I've had patients that I had to put on inhaled steroids just for the month of April. Yeah. Because of, you know, the, the mulberry, yeah. I have a question for you. When do you decide to pursue um, control with in nasal steroids and antihistamines versus starting immunotherapy? Well, uh, in a view of uh, this intriguing new information mm -hmm. about preventing asthma, I think that it would be good to start with immunotherapy, but you have to consider the cost, mm -hmm. you have to consider the compliance uh, with the treatment, and so usually, you know, the first step is really just symptomatic treatment today. I think that's what's done in practice. Any other questions online for Dr. Morosi or cases? Hi, Alice. Michael Lance. Hey, yeah, there he is. We were asking about you. <laughs> I'm going to, I came in late, uh, but I'm going to set you up for a question. Uh, Kenalog shots for allergies. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh. <laughs> yes. It's still happening. I still, you know, oh, yes. uh, yeah, people do it. Uh, sometimes I scratch my head thinking I'm, like, too old and I should be doing it more. Um, anything new on that besides the last time when I asked <laughs> you in the hallway about it? Absolutely nothing new. Okay. And actually, it's, I'm so glad you brought it up because it's very important because people call it allergy shots. Mm -hmm. And I get my twice a year allergy shot and I am fine. Well, the problem is this is a high dose of long acting systemic steroid. <laughs> when it's given over a period of years, will have significant side effect on mm -hmm. bone health, on cataracts and you name it. It's a today when we have topical nasal steroids, there is no justification for using Kenalog shots. Absolutely not. Patients love it. Patients will demand it because that cuts their symptoms off. And for some people, high dose of steroid is actually associated with euphoria. So, <laughs> But Michael, well, thanks for the question. It's nothing has changed. It's still an absolute no. I knew you would appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. That Thank wasn't you. a big challenge, Mike. <laughs> I, I do have a question regarding the topical nasal steroids. Yes. Do you tell patients to only use them for a few days at a time, or can they use them continuously? Um, I believe that uh, so the, the newer topical nasal steroids have about one percent or less systemic absorption and therefore I think they are quite safe to use continuously throughout the season. I, I don't okay. see a reason to, to be stopping it. The only thing I would add to that is, is one, make sure you tell them to take it correctly. Mm -hmm. So I always aim, you want to aim outward right. to your ear. 
on that side because if you're if you're aiming to the middle to the, your nasal septum you're going to have more risk of nasal perforation nasal septal perforation and bleeding and so sometimes i've had patients that have had some bleeding issues as i give it a rest a couple days you know do your neti pot whatever and mm -hmm. and uh, then maybe resume but make sure you aim out mm -hmm. towards your ear on that side because that's where all the turbinates are and so you want to make sure you treat the right part but um, yeah, I agree. I tell them to use it all during allergy season if they can tolerate it. I tell them to use the opposite hand. Yeah. Okay. yeah. To help to do that. I tell them to uh -huh. aim toward the outer corner of the eye. Yeah. <laughs> so we have all our little, little tricks. tricks. What about um, nasal washes? I think they're useful because, uh, number one, they re remove the irritant and allergen from the nose. And secondly, if you use a slightly hypertonic solution, uh, they will reduce the edema. So I think it's a useful treatment. I know Just, we kind of laid off for a bit because there were all those news reports about a year ago about people getting amoebic brain infections that didn't boil their water or on well water. Yeah. Or well water. Oh, you know what they were like, maybe two or three cases in the whole country described and there was such a sensation mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think it's a uh, everyday yeah. occurrence but boil the water or you or distill the like, water yeah. and then you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Other questions for Dr. Morrissey? Patient questions? All right. Well, we'll end a little early, uh, and just note, we will be switching to Wednesdays from Fridays. Switching to Wednesdays. Uh, and the next Wednesday is April 10th. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Michael Lentz again. Um, can I ask for a topic to be um, presented? And yes, which of would course. Be, sure. This is another bomb, I think, but uh, persistent... Uh, bronchial bron or bacterial bronchitis, um, which has been in the the news the literature, you know, um, a bacterial reason for a chronic cough that is not asthma. Um, does anybody have any interest in presenting that? We can certainly schedule it. Sure. I mean, is it something that people come up against, or, or have they? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the whole chronic cough is uh -huh. always a is a problem, and you know, it's the bane of my existence <laughs> and the bane right. of the patient's existence mm -hmm. too, really, because it's so life altering for them. But I think that that could either be rolled into chronic cough or mm -hmm. a separate little uh, topic as well. The other is, you know, kind of the eosinophilic bronchitis. You know, that's not exactly asthma, but um, you know, so it could be a, a set of topics that would be very useful. That's a great idea. Think, Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it would be. And again, the, the, you know, we're supposed to avoid antibiotic use, and uh, it's a cold. It's a cold for weeks. And now some people are saying that maybe we should treat this with antibiotic, but uh, mm -hmm. still uh, I'm not sure if there's good evidence for that. So chronic cough would be, would be great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Michael, and you yeah. probably know what I have found in my practice in children with a chronic cough is a chronic sinusitis. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I put that on top of my list, and that's why sometimes, you know, they respond to antibiotics, but you are treating right. actually the upper. Uh -huh. Yeah, good point, okay. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Did, uh, did we have anybody else join us who hasn't announced their name yet? Hi, um, Marty Brittenham is here, and Patty Holland, RM. Marty's a nurse practitioner at CNM Student Health Center. Oh, great. Okay. And Marty's last name again? Brittenham. Thank you. He is in boy, R I T T E N H A M. And Patty Holland, I'm the RN here at CNM, uh, H A A 
A-D-E-L-A-N-D. And even though we treat adults mostly, um, we thought that this, this webinar would be really, really helpful. Great. Are you related to Chrissy? Christine? Yeah. Yes, I am, as a matter of fact. She oh, I'm her mentor <laughs> in the residency Chris program. Oh, Christine or Kathy? Christine. You mean the, the elderly Christine? No. <laughs> okay. Because I my mother in law is ninety five. Oh no, no. This is a this is an intern in the in medicine residency program that has this last name, so <laughs> there, yeah. No, um okay. no, but that's that's awesome. I'm sure we're related somewhere down the line. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. All right. Thank All right. you, guys. Well, hey. All right. Thanks very much. Okay, but what yeah. happened? No, there should should come up here. Uh,